Good morning, Covenant College. Good morning. Uh, this morning, again, I have the privilege of introducing a faculty speaker in our ongoing series, Dangerous Ideas. <laughs> this morning's speaker uh, really needs no introduction, but I'm going to give one anyway. Uh, in many important ways, Dr. Bill Davis is the walking, living, breathing embodiment of the Covenant College tradition. I would dare say that many of you were first introduced to uh, an important intellectual component of it by reading his book before you even set foot as students on our campus. Uh, a brilliant mind, a servant's heart, a master teacher, and a deeply committed disciple of Jesus, who in all I see him do uh, is uh, taking seriously his commitments to declare the preeminence of Jesus. Dr. Davis and I are friends. And yet, <laughs> Dr. Davis and I haven't always seen things the same way on a variety of basic issues involving what it means to think and to live out our callings as Christians in the modern world. If I was to try to sum it up for you, Dr. Davis thinks that you're special <laughs> and that you might just change the world. And I, of course, don't. <laughs> And you won't. <laughs> but Dr. Davis and I stand together on a great many other things, uh, far more important things. Uh, and I count it a high honor to call him my colleague and my friend. He graduated in 1982 from Covenant College. He holds a graduate degrees from Westminster Seminary in California and the University of Notre Dame. He is the husband of Linda, who is with us. Uh, he is the father of one Covenant College alum and three current students. Uh, Amy, Rachel, and Mark. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bill Davis. Good morning. Hi. My name is Bill and I'm an addict. <laughs> I've been in denial about my addiction for at least 25 years. And this, no, seriously. Um, and this morning I'd like to talk to you about how the denial persists, the excuses I've told myself, what the Holy Spirit did to break through those excuses, and what the Holy Spirit is doing uh, as I fight. Uh, Pastor Flayhart at the beginning of this semester our first chapel told us that Christian life is a three-step. Repent, believe, fight. This is mostly going to be about fight. I'm an addict to entertainment. I've known this at least since the first time my wife caught, caught me, it's an important word here, uh, caught me at sunrise playing rail, uh, railroad tycoon. <laughs> I had been up all night playing railroad tycoon. It was not, and this was 1993, uh, like pathetically terrible graphics, but uh, Sid Meier's precursor to the Civ series uh, was Railroad Tycoon, and I did love it indeed. But it was not the last time my wife would catch me up all night playing Civ 2 was next. Um, Bejeweled took hold of my heart. <laughs> like, you find this funny, it's sad. Um, at some level, this is really messed up. <clears throat> but I told myself it was okay, and I played Bejeweled sometimes hours at a time and felt good. Uh, I realized that that was a problem, but I figured it was a small problem, so I physically broke the disc into pieces and buried it. And then I found out that Candy Crush was online. And Candy Crush is truly evil. Uh, another piece of evidence that I had a serious problem is that I had a stack of things to grade. Some of you can imagine. Maybe your work was in the stack of things to grade. And I was in my office feeling a little sorry for myself that I was beset by such a pile of things to grade that I looked up Candy Crush online and for four hours in my office played Candy Crush Saga. Oh, good. The, the, the laugh, laughter's going down. That's a good sign. <laughs> They're taking this 
with some moderate seriousness. Uh, the dangerous idea I'd like to talk about is dangerous to me, and that is the idea that I deserve to be entertained. Now, uh, being a philosopher, or at least someone who teaches philosophy, I have lots of excellent excuses. Uh, philosophers should not be trusted to give reasons for things, because I can give good reasons for things that I know are false. <clears throat> so even though I suspected there was something wrong, the way I dealt with myself, the way I dealt with this addiction, was that I told myself stories. Usually, the stories that work in rationalizations are those that have some kernel of truth in them, uh, especially if you're into self-denial of this kind. And so one of my favorite ones is, I'm not addicted like other people. I mean, sad, pathetic people are addicted to Facebook or Netflix or League of Legends or, you know, something like that. And I'm not. And because I'm not addicted to the things that you read about people being addicted to, I didn't have a problem. I really like that one, by the way. <clears throat> Another excuse I used is that I get more done than lots of people. And as long as there's other people who do less work than I do, I deserve some me time. Maybe piles of me time. I like that one, too. I think I still believe that one. I mean, even in the middle of trying to deal with it, I think I believe that one. But I shouldn't. I have nice, sophisticated, philosophical excuses. You might like this one. Uh, Nietzsche says that Christians are people who never have fun and therefore want everyone to be as miserable as they are, and I'm out to prove Nietzsche wrong. <laughs> Somebody has to. I'm owning that. I have theological excuses. Work is a curse, so entertainment must be a blessing. Here's another one. This one's not quite so funny. Uh, because I lecture every year on Matthew 25 and the parable of the talents, what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus, I must be an expert on how to be a faithful follower of Jesus. So I can't have a problem. And related to that one, I have been a counselor to alcoholics. I have gone to AA meetings in order to help them deal with their addictions. And because I am a counselor, I must not be in need of counsel. I must not have a problem. Now, look, from this vantage point, we all can see that these are terrible excuses, but I'm just trying to be truthful. They worked. They convinced me that it was okay that I would, in the middle of doing something genuinely productive, I would imagine myself having the opportunity to go play. I, when Bejeweled was at its worst, I would dream Bejeweled. I would be solving spatial puzzles. Um, I love Bejeweled because it's only two-dimensional. My children pay, play Portal, and they're very good at it, and I can't imagine things in three dimensions. So I can't do any of the puzzles, but I like watching them do them. Say, Whoa, didn't see that. Not that either. <laughs> but Bejeweled was two-dimensional. I could do it. <clears throat> The way the Holy Spirit works in convicting you of a problem is typically through uh, ordinary channels, family, friends, things you're reading, you get blindsided by something you thought was not going to be about your problem, and it turns out it is. Uh, and the first step for me was in realizing that the problem was much bigger than games. Um, I check my email compulsively, uh, and when I check my email, I have to check two, three, seven, eight political sites because I have to keep up with what's going on in the world. Um, we have rock bottom basic cable package at home, 10 channels maybe. I will turn on the TV and go through all 10 and maybe watch whatever's best even if it's dreck. You know, I know it's terrible. I wouldn't have chosen it uh, if I'd looked at the TV listings instead of turning on the TV. I wouldn't have turned it on, but I deserve some me time. And maybe most pervasively unhelpful of all, um, I can't drive anywhere without having the radio on. I need mind candy. I don't like silence. <clears throat> I, I deserve to be entertained. Now, one of the ways that I became aware that there was, uh, one of the other ways that I became aware there was a problem is that I was ashamed when I was caught. People would see me playing games and I would quickly hit the boss button, 
Not the boss like the end of the game, not that kind of boss. There's a button, there, this was it's an old joke. There's a button you hit and it makes it look like you're doing work. But I would turn the machine off or I would do something so that people weren't aware that I was in the middle of yet another game of solitaire. Like, solitaire. No, think about it for a minute. When you see people playing solitaire, do you think, that is a rich and full life? <laughs> no. You have the same thought I do. You think, oh, that's kind of sad. Um, and none of you think, I'm real sure that if Jesus comes back right now, he'll say, yeah, that's what I had in mind. <laughs> so I, was, I became aware. The Holy Spirit made me aware, convicted me. You feel ashamed. Um, and when people would ask me to do something that I'd promised to do or something important when I was in the middle of entertaining myself, um, I would get annoyed, maybe even a little bit angry, like, hey, wait a minute. I do enough around here. Shame, anger, if you're an addiction specialist, you know these are looking a lot like the symptoms that would go with it. <clears throat> I was reading other things. I was reading Pascal because uh, I, wanted, uh, I was getting ready for modern philosophy next fall. I was reading Pascal, thinking we might do a little more with him. Pascal has this provocative section on distraction and how human beings are, have this odd property that they, are, they, are, they don't want to be left alone with their thoughts, and so they divert themselves. Now, Pascal's writing in the 17th century, so he's not writing about uh, video games or Netflix or any of that. He's writing about gambling, hunting, and dancing. But he says, these are the things people do so they don't have to reflect on what God wants them to do, on the manner and condition of their life. I'm reading that thinking, I don't like this section. Where does it end? There we go. Let's get on to something that bashes scientists. There, that's better. <laughs> um, I was reading Near Isle's book, Hooked. Um, I brought it up here because it's a nice color and you can see it, probably see the title from there. Um, Isle is uh, one of the developers of Candy Crush. And his job was to make Candy Crush so addicting that even if you get the game for free, you are willing to pay to keep playing. So he's written a book on how he does that. <clears throat> that was way too convicting. More on Isle in a minute. What I discovered through all of these things is that ultimately my desire to be entertained is I'm just selfish. When I'm being entertained, the world is serving me and I am serving no one else. What I learned from Isle is that, and uh, the beginning of it is that you have to find triggers, and this is standard addiction counseling. You have to find triggers, and so I started uh, praying that God would show me what it was that was hooking me to entertainment. And I discovered that when I feel sorry for myself that I have so much work to do, I play games so that I can remind myself that I'm okay. I don't have to work. I deserve to be entertained. When I wonder whether anyone loves me or if they'd miss me if I were dead, I check my email. Now look, yeah, look, I know that's dumb. But there was a connection. I would check email in order to be reassured that I was loved. When I get anxious about whether the world is falling apart, not that there's any reason to wonder about that, uh, but when I get anxious about that, I would look at the political sites, but I wouldn't look to, to read opinions that differed from mine, I would go looking for stuff that agreed with me so that I could read it and think, yep, I'm right, it's falling apart, but I understand it. And when I get stressed, generally vaguely stressed, I turn on noise. Sports talk, political talk, music that I'm not really paying attention to, and I deal with it. And so all of these are needs that entertainment has been filling. <clears throat> now, especially distressing is that you find the Holy Spirit speaking to you about your problem as you're reading the scriptures. In Luke 17, my least favorite story Jesus tells. It isn't clear to me that it counts as a parable. I don't know, Dr. Tate later can tell me whether this counts as a parable. In Luke 17, verses 7 through 10, Jesus says, 
Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to the servant, Prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. What? Um, I went to commentators hoping that someone would tell me that that passage does not mean what it seems to mean. And everybody, and I'm really depressed about this, everybody, Calvin, Matthew Henry, liberal commentators who get everything else wrong, nonetheless say... But Jesus says two things here very clearly. We are always his servants, and it's never about us being served. And absolutely everything that I have is a matter of grace. God owes me nothing. No one owes me entertainment, least of all God. I am always his servant. So what does the fight look like? What does it look like for me? Uh, I'm an addict. What you know about addiction is it's something you're going to deal with your whole life. So I know that however many more years God gives me, I'm going to be fighting this addiction, discovering new triggers um, and deeper and darker corners of my love of being entertained. So the first thing to say is that some diversion is not selfish. Sometimes entertainment is part of serving Jesus because you are recharging your batteries. You're being restored in your ability to focus. Uh, I've discovered, I'm, I have tested this, and it takes me about 15 minutes when I finish one task, and it's time to do another one. If I'm getting enough sleep at night, more on that some other time, um, if I'm getting enough sleep at night, it takes me 15 minutes of doing something entertaining to get restored so that I can go back to work. If I've gone longer than 15 minutes, it's selfish. I don't need it in order to be Jesus' servant. I've also learned that some forms of entertainment are fine if I'm doing them with other people because the entertainment is part of deepening my relationship with them. I play Lego Avengers with my children. And as long as one of them is playing, we find Stan Lee and achieve true believer status. If it's just me, I don't. I don't find Stan Lee, and it's sad. But that's something that I can do. It's entertainment as part of doing something that Jesus has called me to do, is to have a deep relationship with my children and my friends. And so that's not selfish. Now, I can do it in a selfish way. I can do it for no purpose other than turning my brain off, and my children can tell, because I'm even worse at the game. I'm not very good but it's fun. Um, I also have to put physical obstacles. Another part of the fight is finding things that stand between me and entertainment. So uh, the computer at home where I most of the time go to check my email and uh, look for political blogs that reinforce what I already believe <coughs> has a collection of poems up so that when I, turn, when I fire the machine up, There's uh, Longfellow's Collected Works, and instead of checking my email or uh, looking at the political blogs, I read another poem. I mumble it to myself. Uh, Dr. Tate has been pestering me for something like years, maybe a decade, to to read poetry like it'd be good for my soul. What? Um, But it's surprisingly helpful. Uh, Longfellow's, uh, Longfellow's a believer. Longfellow looks at nature. I have, I see the glory of God's world in a way that I didn't before I started reading. Um, I see just how subtle the language is, or at least a new layer of subtlety to, uh, to the language that I didn't see before, and so this is productive. Now, it doesn't, it, it's also entertaining. It doesn't have to be miserable to be part of fighting against an addiction to entertainment, but it needs to be part of becoming a better servant of Jesus, and poetry, like bizarrely, Longfellow apparently is, is like even, it's the D-League of poetry, but I find it helpful. Um, 
I now read books again. I mostly read books that will make it possible for me to have conversations with my children. I've started reading Terry Pratchett because they like Terry Pratchett. And that's why, so that I can talk to them. That's uh, fun, but not selfish. Most importantly, I've learned to seek silence. When I get in the car, the rule is the first half of the drive, nothing's on. It's just me. And it might end up being the whole drive because what I'm doing, what I'm doing to fill up the emptiness of silence is I'm praying. And easily, the most important casualty of my addiction to entertainment is my prayer life. Because as long as I'm being entertained, I'm not praying. Now, the point in this talk is not for you to see how smart I was in detecting my failures or how smart I was in figuring out ways to fight against my failures. The point is that the Holy Spirit is at work, and this is what it looks like to fight as part of your walk with Jesus, is that you put obstacles in the way. You ask other people to ask you hard questions. So, how many games of solitaire have you played today? Um, like, with some trepidation, I deputize all of you to ask me this question. That was so stupid. Um, but you could. The Holy Spirit has opened my eyes to this addiction through family and friends uh, who are part of the fight. The Holy Spirit is urging me to fight. Every good thing I have from the entertainment that I enjoy as part of my faithful service to Jesus to the family and friends who are sharing it with me and trying to convince me not to make it into um, a selfish fascination are gifts from God. I'd like for us to close by singing the doxology to God from whom all blessings flow. Wherever Chapman went, he's going to start us and let's close by singing to God. <clears throat>